you very much for the orga to the organizers. <laughs> so thank you very much to Wolfgang and Luke who did the most of the work, I have to say, for organizing this conference. And thank you for all of you to, to have agreed to come and to give these uh, lectures. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a result which now is not so recent, but uh, um, the purpose, I guess, is to, uh, to advertise a little bit uh, more uh, this notion that we introduced with uh, Eric Gatner and, and, and Godiong Liu, uh, this finite decomposition complexity. So I'm going to introduce it, to introduce the motivation relatively quickly, and I'm going, as soon as I can, to explain what we can do with this property and how we can prove, for instance, that linear groups have it. So that would be the main goal of my talk, is to explain this, uh, this, uh, this uh, results. So, yeah, so let me just recall very briefly uh, the Borel conjecture. So let M and N a spherical closed manifolds. Uh, the Borel conjecture says that if you have an isomorphism an isomorphism from the from the fundamental groups uh, is induced by your homeomorphism. Um, you have also um, a weak version of the Borel conjecture, which is a stable Borel conjecture. So if I add stable here, then I, weak, I weaken a little bit uh, the conclusion by saying that this is true up to stabilization. Now there is a, a, a bounded Borel conjecture, which is a large scale version, which you, you, you can formulate it for manifolds which are non-compact, but I'm just going to keep to stay with this uh, framework. So I'm the, the bounded Borel conjecture tells you the following thing. It tells you that if you, are, if you keep the same, the same assumptions, uh, if you have a quasi-asymmetry from the universal covers this time, then it is, so a quasi-asymmetry is at bounded distance from a homeomorphism. So here, of course, so a quasi-asymmetry uh, is, um, is like a bi lipschitz map up to additive constant. So it's not, it doesn't have to be continuous. It doesn't have to have any kind of nice behavior at small scale. So it's only something which is good at large scale. Um, so, uh, sorry, there is a tilde which is missing here. So here, of course, to talk about quasi-asymmetry, um, it's better to have a metric on the manifold. So let's suppose that M is a Riemannian manifold if you want, but you don't, you don't need, really need to because here in this setting, you can put any metric that you like, which is kind of, you don't, it doesn't have to be uh, very well defined at small distances. So you have the pi one of the manifold, which has a world metric, and you can in take any metric you want on your manifold, uh, which uh, is quasi asymmetric to the metric on the pi one, and gives you something that en enables you to state this statement. And that's enough. Uh, the conclusion is a bounded distance from a homeomorphism, so you don't really need to talk about any differentiable uh, structure on your manifolds. Okay, so the connection between the two is not uh, completely obvious, so, um, and that's the point. So, yeah, so the bounded Borel sounds like a weak version of the Borel conjecture in the sense that um, the conclusion is weaker, of course. I mean, uh, you get something which is not, you don't get a homomorphism which is equivariant, so that goes down to the quotient. But on the other hand, the assumption is also weaker because when you ask the pi ones to be isomorphic, if you look at the level of the universal cover, it means that you have, uh, that you have um, a quasi asymmetry between the manifolds which is equivariant, which is coming from a an isomorphism, uh, isomorphism for the pi ones. So the conclusion is also that you get something which is equivariant. On the other hand, for the bounded Borel, you just start with a quasi-asymmetry which doesn't have to be uh, equivariant. So the conclusion also doesn't have to be equivariant, which is kind of natural in a sense. Um, so, um, so 
So our main results with uh, Gettner, I don't even remember when it was done, <laughs> uh, some time ago, uh, is that um, if phi 1 of m has FDC, which I will, I'm going to explain uh, later, uh, which is a coarse geometric property, uh, then the bounded and, um, and the stable Borel conjectures hold. Um, so, yeah, and oh, I forgot something. Uh, you need, of course, the dimension to be large enough because we are uh, using uh, some uh, surgery theory which only works for high dimension. Um, <coughs> so, of course, I mean, the point is that we, we are not actually proving directly some topological result. We are going through all this uh, assembly map um, uh, business. So, the point really is uh, this FTC uh, property is a tool to uh, perform some kind of excision on the right-hand term of the assembly map. So if you remember, uh, the left-hand term is the one that we understand, which is a homology theory, and the right-hand term is something which is hard to, to work with because you don't have excision. A priori, it's not a homology. But the point is that with some kind of this, ca this course property, which I'm going to, to, to define, you, you can still perform some kind of excision at large scale, in a sense. So this works fine in the bounded setting. So there is a, a, a bounded, um, uh, I'm, I hope this is Farrell Jones assembly map. And what we prove, which we actually prove our real theorem, the theorem that we, that we actually prove is that this is, uh, this is an isomorphism. It's bijective, this uh, for uh, when, when the group. So this uh, assembly map is associated to the group by when. Uh. Actually, it's only associated to the metric space by one equipped with the world metric. It doesn't really care about the group itself, but it's associated to the to the metric space underlying it. So to to the group. So our real theorem is that this assembly map is an isomorphism when gamma has FTC. And here, actually, you can forget at this point, you can forget even that your group is the pi one of a spherical manifold. It only has to be, actually, it only has to be, in some sense, only a metric space. So it, it only has to be a, any countable group with a left invariant metric, which is proper, and which has this FTC condition. Uh, but then at some point, we use this same principle and here again, we use that pi one, uh, that gamma has a k pi one, finite k pi one, to uh, deduce uh, injectivity of the usual assembly map. So we get what is called uh, integral Novikov. We get it in L-theory. Um, we also got it in K-theory for algebraic K-theory in any degree. Uh, this is joint work with, uh, so for algebraic K-theory, this is joint work with um, uh, Dan Ramas and you, a bit later. The point is that we didn't have exactly the same tools uh, at our disposal. Uh, which were two due to Raniski and, uh, and Yamasaki that we could use in this setting. So we had to kind of work more to, to get it for, for algebraic theory. And, and so from there, you can deduce the stable Borel. So uh, from there, directly, you get the bounded Borel. From this uh, injectivity, you get the stable Borel. No. Uh, 
But just to be on the, on the safe side, I would say torsion free. I will have to check. I don't remember very well. Torsion free. Hmm. I think you're right because they, yeah, yes. then you need some kind of equivariant respect to find out the group, so yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, by the way, it, it is definitely the case because we, we deal with the case finite by one, so. Yeah, but you want us to keep it at that end. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So let me now talk a little bit about the property itself. So before even I'm going to define it, I'm going to advertise it. <laughs> Not that way. Uh, oh, there is something which is much nicer, yeah. Let's use to it. We don't have this in France, which is really stupid. We should have it. <laughs> Everything else is fine. But so, yeah. So, what are the good? the good uh, properties of this FTC. So the first FTC stands for finite <coughs> decomposition complexity. Because it encodes some kind of finiteness condition, some, some nice finiteness condition in the complexity, in the metric complexity of, of, a, of a metric space. So it's a property which is defined for a metric space. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the nice properties uh, of, of this uh, property <laughs> are the following. So the first thing that we can say is what are the groups satisfying it? Um, so there is a long list of groups, but uh, so um, the class of countable groups C contains um, elementary amenable groups um, groups with finite asymptotic dimension so in particular hyperbolic groups Uh, more interesting, I would say, um, subgroups of um, countable subgroups of of GLN for any uh, commutative ring. Uh, so this is the first point. Then the st stability property. Um, stability property, so oh, it is stable under quasi asymmetry, which is uh, somehow necessary to give even a clear meaning to this statement here. Because when I say the class of countable groups, of course I mean countable groups equipped with a left invariant proper metric, but two different left invariant proper metrics are course equivalent between them. So you'd better work with the notion which is course equivalent to start with. So the, uh, it is stable under course equivalence, particularly it does not depend on the choice of such a, such a metric. Um, and in the special case of finitely generated groups, course equivalence is the same as quasi-asymmetry. Um, it is uh, stable under um, subgroups, extensions, um, direct limit, and uh, um, free product with amalgamation. <coughs> Over any subgroup. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, if you combine uh, the two, you get it. So, so it's quite stable. 
Okay, so now I'm going to explain the property itself. Even if the property is very hard to define, I'm just going to, to start with, the, with recalling the, excuse me? What did I? Oh, yeah, sorry. Three products with amalgamation. So, yeah. So, before I reintroduce the property itself, let me um, recall the proof that R, with its usual Euclidean distance, has asymptotic dimension one. So even I, I, I won't even have to recall you what is asymptotic dimension. I will just give you the proof of a statement, and then I will tell you that FDC uh, is like the statement that you iterate in a sense. So I just need color, I have color, so that's fine. So you start with R, okay? So R is a line. And suppose you are given some big number. And I want to chop R into pieces which are bounded, but which have two colors, two different colors, and satisfying certain properties. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take interval of intervals of length uh, 2R, let's say. Two is not so important, but. And I'm going to color, to put two colors. So the even ones will be in, uh, in red and the odd ones will be uh, in blue. And so on. So now wh what did I do? I, I, I wrote R as a union of two sets, one which is x0, which is the union of these uh, red intervals, and the blue one, which is x1, which is the union of these blue intervals. Now, what is the nice properties of x0 and x1? Uh, the point is that x0 is not bounded. Uh, that would be the best, but it is a union of very, very far away, far apart pieces which are all bounded. So x, x0, and same for x1, is a union which is R disjoint, actually it's two R disjoint. So R disjoint means really that two elements in this union are far apart at, at distance R from one another of um, things, which are these intervals, which have uniformly bounded diameter. is bounded by something. Here it's actually 2R, but, uh, but it's not so important. The point is it is, in, it is uniformly bounded. And you have the same property for x1. So if you think about the fact that we are trying to do some kind of excision, actually more precisely, some mayer vietoris argument, for a, 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 um, um, a large infinite space, we are trying to do it at large scale, meaning that um, you don't being open is not, is not relevant there, but somehow neighbor, you have to replace the fact that you are open by the fact that you can you allow yourself to take neighborhood of a bounded amount. So here, really, the point is that bounded objects will be the trivial objects in this setting. So you're trying um, your best to cut your space into pieces so that in the end you get bounded pieces. But of course, you cannot do it in one way because you, have, you would have to deal with infinitely many pieces. But you also remember that being very far apart is good also because being far apart means that really that they don't interact, the pieces don't interact. So having a space which is a very w dejoint uh, union of, of nice pieces is like having the pieces themselves. Okay? So here we prove that R has asymptotic dimension one. Now to define properly the, 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 the property, I will need just to introduce a little bit of vocabulary. As I said, the idea behind the, the property is to iterate this procedure. So you see that after even one step, 
you get many pieces here, the x01, which this time won't have to be bounded because it will be only the first step. But so you will, you will after one step, you will already have to, be, to deal with a bunch of spaces and not only one space. So for that reason, it's more convenient to work from the very beginning with families of metric spaces instead of just single metric spaces. So a metric family is just a set of metric spaces or a family. So generally, I will just denote it by a curly uh, x, something like this. Um, now, you see that there is this notion of you start with R and you end up with a bunch of bounded pieces. So there is a notion of decomposition, decompos decomposability or decomposition, um, associated to a number. So this is called R decomposition. So suppose you have two metric families, X and Y. You say that, denoted like that, which means that X, R decomposes over the metric family Y. If, um, so there is this parameter R, which means this is here, which is a big parameter. If for every X metric space in the metric family X, um, you have such a decomposition. So you can write X as X0 union X1 such that each xi is itself an RD joint union of xijs. And now you don't require necessarily that the pieces that you get are bounded, but you require that they form a subset of y. And the set of all pieces is included in y. So you replace your original family by a family which is supposed to be nicer than the previous one uh, with the requirement that you had this decomposition in between. Uh, so in particular, this gives you a possible definition, which is actually the original definition of having an asymptotic, uh, asymptotic dimension one. So in particular, um, just that's a re restatement, uh, having asymptotic dimension one is the same. It's, 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 uh, I mean, it's not. It's a definition. It's essentially the definition uh, is the same as saying that um, X, the family just restricted to your metric space, um, for every R there exists uh, Y, a bounded metric family. So bounded metric family means that the supremum over all elements in your metric family of the diameters is just finite. It's, 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 it's uniformly bounded. Uh, R, so for every R, there exists Y such that. Excuse me. So, saying that X X has asymptotic dimension one is the same as saying that for every R, there exists a bounded metric family Y. No, 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 no. The bound is not R. It's just a bound. It, dep it may depend on R. But it's a bound. For every R, there exists a bounded metric family with a bound that might depend on R um, and on X, such that you have this R decomposition. This is having a, a finite symptotic dimension one. So now it's not very hard to guess what could be uh, a natural generalization of that by iteration, except that in our case, uh, so after the natural way to do it, the first thing that we thought about would, would be to say that suppose you have a sequence of, 
of numbers, R1, R2, Rn, you want to have a sequence of decomposition such that it ends after some time, you get a bounded family. Except that if you do that, uh, well, you cannot really you cannot really do what we <laughs> needed to do, so you need something a bit stronger than that, which is well um, encoded in a game, in a strat strategy, if you want. But it's a very simple one, it's not something uh, fancy. So it's called the decomposition game. So the decomposition game is uh, the following thing. So um, you have two players, one is a turtle, And one is a rabbit. You like my rabbit? <laughs> I have to practice because I have a young daughter <laughs> who likes, who loves my my drawings. So. so uh, and so the, the total is our enemy, and we are really the rabbits. We try to go fast. We try to get rid of, uh, of, of our space and to get many pieces which are small. So you start, of course, with your metric family. So the, the data, the, the, the your initial data of the game is the metric family X that you denote X naught to say that this is the first step or the initial step. So the first, the first step of the game starts with the total giving you a number. Then the rabbit has to think for a while, sometimes not for very long. And uh, after that, he gives you back a decomposition of x, 0, into using this parameter r1 that was given by the total, x1. The game may stop if x, if x1 is, is bounded. Otherwise, the game goes, goes on again. What? And the winner should be the rabbit if you're, if you're, if you're lucky or if you're... <laughs> I never played this game with my daughter. I should maybe try. <laughs> So, and the point is that uh, a definition is that your metric family has uh, FTC if uh, the rabbit has a winning strategy. So it sounds a bit fancy like that, but it's actually very flexible and very easy to work with this definition. Uh, there is another one which is more like inductive, saying that uh, you start with bounded families and you define inductively things which uh, decompose into other things. Uh, but this one is better, I would say, because th with this one you can really uh, prove anything you want. I mean, it's but very easy. Yeah, yeah. So then the, 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 the next uh, step is that your total gives you another number, hoping that this time you won't be able to do anything. This number is like completely huge uh, and feasible, but still you do another decomposition. And yes, and a winning strategy meaning that um, after a certain number of steps, it stops, uh, the, the rabbit is able to produce a bounded, a bounded family. Huh? So for instance, so let me state a proposition. Um, actually, it's a fact, it's not completely obvious, essentially due to, I mean, it's due essentially to Dranishnikov, to a result of Dranishnikov, the corollary of a result of, Dranish, of Dranishnikov, that um, if x has, um, sorry, um, if the winning strategy, or if that, sorry, if there exists a winning strategy in um, n steps, because what I didn't tell you is that the number of steps is not supposed to be bounded a priori. But if there exists n, such that you have a winning strategy in n steps, then it implies that x, or the metric space or the metric family, you know, it's also defined, has a synthetic dimension less than p to the n. 
whatever this notion is. I mean, you just have to think that, for instance, for instance, this is the case for, for Vn. Uh, essentially, I gave you the proof that you get a winning strategy in one step for R or for Z. If you do ZD, uh, it's not hard to see that you have a winning strategy um, in, um, in N steps. And I mean, of course, the, the, the best result is that the, the asymptotic dimension of ZN is N, but at least you can deduce that the winning strategy is less than 2 to the N. Okay, so ZN has um, a winning strategy. in n steps, by which I mean the rabbit, in this case, has a winning strategy in n steps for z. OK, but the next example is an example where uh, you don't have finite asymptotic dimension, but still have a winning strategy, which is not bounded a priori. It's a very simple example. Oh, yes, and what I didn't say, sorry, uh, this implication is a triviality, I'm sorry. Well, what is not a complete triviality is that if you have a finite asymptotic dimension, then you have also um, a winning strategy. So if the dimension is uh, n, I think the strategy has at most uh, n plus 1 steps, something like that. It's not tight. Uh, the two bounds are not tight. And we never tried, actually, to, to investigate whether it can be improved or we never really thought about that. Yes, exactly. So, no, 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 no. Having a winning strategy only means that whatever the t that you have a way to, to react to the total so that whatever the total does, you can win in finite time. For, for it means that you have a, 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 you have a um, and so for whatever the total tells you, you have a way to, to do your decomposition so that in finite time, you don't know exactly how much time it would be because it would depend on what the total does. But you are sure that in finite time it will stop. It won't go forever. And finite time to the dimension is equivalent to the fact that you have a win strategy in a bounded number of steps that, which is given in advance. Yes. And, and time is, is a number. OK, thanks. So this is due to the Ranishnikov. Is it clear now? I'm going to do that, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do that so that you. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. So let me, let me give you an example yeah. that will show that. So let, let me just, uh, let me just um, um, say what, what's one more time what is written here. So what is written here is that having a winning strategy in a bounded number of steps, bounded in advance, is equivalent to, ha to, being, to, ha to, <coughs> to having finite asymptotic dimension. What I'm saying is that there might be situations where you have a win strategy, but you don't know in advance how much time it will take because it will depend on what the, 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 the turtle is doing. And I'm going to give you an example of that right now. And you will see actually this, this example. It's very easy to see from. No. 
That's the point. It's only a strategy. And so the, the first example, the, the easiest example of something which doesn't have uh, finite identity dimension but yet has um, uh, FTC is an infinite direct sum of copies of Z. Uh, you want a metric on, on that so that uh, this uh, group uh, has a proper well, uh, a finite, uh, both have finite size. So what you can put for, for the distance between two sequences is, for instance, the sum, the weighted L1 sum. Okay, so you can put L plus 1 up to, up to 0. Okay, <coughs> so now you have the property that the balls of radius n are bounded. <coughs> so now, what you have is the following. Um, I'm going to play the game with my turtle and my rabbit. And um, so first of all, my turtle gives me a number, R1. So what do I do with this number? I have my, my space x, my g. And I want to decompose it into things which are R1 separated, and they have to be nicer. <coughs> what can I do? I can look at the ball of radius R1. The ball of radius R1 is finite because of the choice of my metric, so it's a proper metric. So it is, I didn't do the computation, I should probably, uh, the ball of radius R1 will be contained in um, 1 to R1, tell me if I'm wrong, how to not, <coughs> oops, sorry, of copies of these. So the first R1 copies of these. You cannot go beyond that. Uh, is it right, or should I take something bigger? So. It might not be right here, sorry. Uh, but the point is that it is a finite number of copies of these. So, and what, what is the point in doing that? This is a subgroup of, of G. And the point is that if you take, it contains the ball of radius R1. So if you take two cosets, two distinct cosets of this subgroup, let's call it G index R1, uh, they are R1 distant from one another. Because you have that G R1 equals g r1 multiplied by the ball of radius r1, which means that the r1 neighborhood of g r1 is contained in r1, meaning really that two different cosets, so if you look at the different cosets g r1, they are r1 disjoints. Okay. <coughs> so what I can do, what my rabbit can do, is producing this decomposition into cosets, gr1. But now my cosets individually, they are all z to the power, I mean, okay, so zero. So each coset is isometric with some proper metric. I'm not saying it's exactly the L1 metric, but it's with some proper metric. It's isometric to z to the r1 plus 1, which is, which has finite assembly dimension. So now I know when I am at this step that I need only R1 plus one steps to finish the game. So then, so which is essentially the same as dealing with even one space, huh? uh, R1 plus one. So now I can end the game. So But as you can see, the number of steps now depends on this first step. Uh, so you could not predict in advance how many steps you would need to end the game. But you know that you always have a way to finish it. And this is coherent with the fact that this infinite, copy, infinite sum of copies of these doesn't have finite asymptotic dimension. Because the dimension is at least the dimension of a subgroup, and uh, you have z to the d for every d. And Yeah, that's a problem. And you cannot do better. Uh, well, you could improve maybe the precise bound, but it, it has to be like that. It has to be like that. That's the point of the previous proposition. <coughs> um, OK, so now I'm, I'm, I would like to explain uh, how you can prove that linear groups have the property. 
So the theorem I'm going to talk about now, which is again a theorem by uh, is that the following thing. So let's say that uh, gamma finitely generated subgroup of GL, GL, Z of K, where K is a field, commutative field. Uh, commutative is, uh, in English, it's always commutative. Uh, if the characteristic of K is positive, then gamma has finite asymptotic dimension. Excuse me? Oh yeah, uh, yes. You, you take uh, um, yeah. you take the risk product. Z with Z. Oh, by the way, let me just say something about um, the stability properties of this prop of this uh, of this decomposition of this uh, decomposition uh, uh, FTC property. Uh, it, it's it's quite easy actually to see that the proof that I gave that the direct sum of copies of Z uh, has FTC can be uh, used without any change to show that FTC is stable on the direct union. Okay. That is here because you, you, you have the fact that this infinite copies of Z is a direct union of Z to the power of something. And that's what we used. So stability on the direct uh, union is, is essentially obvious uh, and it's given by this proof. Uh, stability on the extension is very simple also. It's just concatenating strategies. And most of the proofs actually are of this kind. I mean, uh, stability properties are very easy to establish. Well, when you look at actions of trees, you have to work a little bit more, but it's essentially easier than the proof that uh, finite simplicity dimension, for instance, is, sta is stable. Because you, it's more flexible and you don't require any quantitative bound of any kind, so it's, it's very easy to prove. So for extension, it's also very easy. You just concatenate strategies. Um, so it then has finite asymptotic dimension. And if the characteristic is zero, that's not always the case. And we give you an example. But at least what we know is that gamma has FTC. We can quantify FTC uh, using an ordinal, but I'm not going to do that. And in this case, you can say something explicit. But I'm not going to prove that, that result uh, in complete generality, but I'm going to give you the proof in a special case which contains the main ID. Well, the first thing to wonder when we you deal with a, a linear group, which is a general linear group, in the sense that it's not uh, a lattice or a discrete subgroup in a Lie group or something like that, you need to know which metric you have to use in order to exploit the fact that it's a linear group. So the first, so let me, the, the, let me ex ex explain the proof for gamma equals, so the proof of the second statement, because I'm going to work in, in, in a zero characteristic, gamma being um, GLD of Z of X. Why z of x? Because this is the first case where you see an infinite sum of copies of z's in your group. Uh, if you look at the, so inside this group, even for d equals 2, you have this group which lives inside uh, gl, uh, inside gamma. And this group is isomorphic to uh, this infinite copies of z's. So you know that you don't have an asymptotic dimension. You will have to deal in particular with these uh, things. Um, yeah, so the point is that the, the first ID, the, the naive ID, we would say, the first ID would be to embed it into GLN of R, uh, to embed gamma into GLN of R. And of, sorry, GLD of R. And of course, the, the, the problem that you, that you are facing here is that 
um, is that it is not discrete. So the metric that you have on GLD of R, coming, for instance, from a Riemannian, a left invariant Riemannian metric, doesn't help you much to understand what's going on on gamma. At least not alone. If you're only using this embedding, maybe this embedding will be useful at some point, but just alone is not enough because you have too much junk. If gamma is a dense subgroup, for instance, you don't really get any idea. So the, 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 the idea of the proof is, is not due to us. Of the proof is essentially, um, I'm not sure if they are really the first ones to do that, but I would say I'll, the first time when I really Alperin and Chalen. And it, it was also used uh, in a very similar way uh, by um, Gettner. and uh, Weinberger. Uh, Alper Alper and Challen is in uh, 81, so it's much older, but uh, somehow, the, no. And it was also used by Broyard for his uh, topological fixed alternative, so more or less at the same time. And so the idea is to use valu discrete valuations to embed gamma into a different group, GL of something else, uh, where the something else is uh, somehow bigger than R in a sense, but where you have, uh, where you can still uh, prove many finiteness properties. So the idea is to use, uh, in our case, I'm not going to do the general case, so is to, is to embed Z of X into its field of fraction. So, so far, there is nothing very interesting, because the field of fraction also embeds in R. But, um, but to use a metric on Q of, on, uh, Q of X, which is not the metric coming from R, from its embedding into R. So you, you will use the valuation on uh, Q of X. Uh, I don't need to define it because I will give you something explicit, which is defined as, as follows. So if look at valuation of P mod Q, P over Q, is just the degree of P minus the degree of Q. So you might say, well, now we have to complete things, and so we don't have to do that. Just keep your valuation and define directly a metric. From there, define an invariant, a left invariant, pseudo metric on GL. D of the field that you can, of course, induce to your original gamma. Uh, sorry, the field of fraction, which is defined as follows. So to define a left invariant pseudometric, you only need to define. So pseudometric means that it's a metric. It has triangular inequality. It satisfies that the, bo um, the distance between uh, an element to itself is zero, but that the ball of radius zero might be big might be more than just one element. And in this case, it will be actually pretty big, as you will see. So to define an invari left invariant pseudometric, you need to define a length function on the group. So the length function is defined as follows. G being a matrix, it's um, um, the infimum of or the maximum, no, the maximum. want it to be a, a non-negative number. <laughs> uh, so this is the valuation of the coefficient of G, and this is the valuation of the coefficients of the uh, G inverse. Okay. So you have to check that uh, you, you have some ultrametric uh, uh, properties of, 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 this, uh, of the norm associated to the valuation, so that you, you, you can prove, it's very easy to prove that this indeed defines a length function or a pseudo length function. On, uh, so it is a sub-additive, that's the point, uh, on, um, on, on G. Uh, I, I, will call, I will give it a name. I will call it G. You have gamma and you have G. Okay. So now, why is it uh, useful to have this um, pseudo length? Well, in order to understand why it is useful, uh, 
it's good to understand, for instance, what is the ball of radius zero. Because really, our problem with uh, embedding into R was that if you take the ball of radius something which is small in GLD of R, you already get too many elements of gamma. So here, you'd like to understand what do you have in the ball of radius zero. Probably, you, are, you still have too many elements. But So what is the ball of radius zero for this metric L? What is it? So what it is, is uh, precisely by definition, it is GLD of O, which I'm going to define, uh, where O is a ring defined by uh, elements in Q of X, of valuation less or equal than zero, which means that the degree of P minus the degree of Q, or the degree of P is uh, uh, less or equal than the degree of Q. I hope I did it in the right direction so that it is a ring. Uh, let me see. I think it's fine. Yeah? Okay, so, um, okay, so this is the first thing. So now, um, the fact that the ball is big will be useful for the, due to the following proposition. Um, you can write, this is by, this is, it's a lemma. It will be useful, why is it useful? It will be useful because the fact that you throw away many things by having a big ball of radius zero implies that your group Will, be, will have some nice properties, and you will see it right away. So, um, um, so by just elementary um, uh, manipulations of matrices, this was already uh, in, in the paper by, uh, by Gettner, Hickson, and Weinberger, you have that G can be written as T, D, I'm going to explain what this is, multiplied by the ball of radius zero, namely G, L, D, and T of D Q of X is the following group. It's a subgroup of triangular matrices where on the diagonal you only have powers of X. What? Is the ball of radius zero. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, 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 sorry. Of radius, thank you. Of radius zero around one in G. For the metric associated to L. Okay, sorry. Huh? Sorry for this uh, notation which didn't make any sense. So, so where you have and here, you have elements in, uh, in, in Q of X. Okay. So why is it better? What, what, what is the, metrically, what is the interpretation of this lemma? Well, you see that here you have the ball of radius zero, which means that essentially you have nothing metrically. So this means, this is essentially equivalent, implied at least, that the embedding of T inside a G is an isometry if you take the restriction of the distances. So an isometry, it's an isometry really on the nose. I mean, it's, it's not exactly surjective. Because, uh, but because it's only because it's a pseudo-metric. If you would take the metric space associated to the pseudo-metric, you'd get an isometry on the nose. In, in the so it is not exactly subjective, but every point in the image is at, bond, at distance zero from a point, or every point in the target is at distance zero from a point in the image. Huh? So which means that if you want to understand nice metric properties of G, it's enough to understand nice properties of this guy. But why is this guy much better? Well, because you, you can easily see that 
that T, uh, TD is, is just an extension of ZD by a unipotent group. Okay, so it's an extension. You have U, D, Q of X, uh, T. It's a direct, it's a semi-direct product. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, you, you can do it with a, with a pseudo-metric space. It's not a problem. Oh, uh, by the way, oh, you will see, I mean, you, you will see, I mean, it will be very explicit. So the proof will be so explicit that you can, you can solve this question uh, for, uh, easily uh, by yourself. You will see that the proof gives you what you are, what you are asking for, so <laughs> it's not a problem. So the point is that this uh, guy here, is, um, is an extension of ZD by something here that we have to deal with. Of course, this guy is the set of, of unipotent matrices. Excuse me? It is, but, but it is too big. Uh, uh, okay, it is elementary. I mean, uh, it is, uh, you're right, but uh, it's solvable. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I could do that, but I, I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I prefer... Uh, I prefer to go on with that. <laughs> just because even if it's true, I mean, uh, it will be, uh, I think it's interesting to see uh, the details of the proof. But you are right, actually. <laughs> That's a good point. But, um, yeah, so, so this one is, unipot is unipotent. It's an impotent group, uh, as, as you just said. Even if it's a bit big, in a sense, but it is still countable. So it right, follows from what I said. But now, the point is that, okay, we don't have the usual, oh, but no, sorry, this is why I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, okay, it's true, but it, I'm not dealing with the usual world matrix. I'm not dealing with the proper matrix, so I cannot apply this. Uh, it's not a proper matrix, sorry. It's not a proper matrix, so I cannot apply what I said about the fact that these groups have FTC. They have the FTCs for their proper matrix. They don't have FTCs for any kind of matrix, a priori. So here is a really a bad matrix, even not a matrix, a pseudo matrix, which some people don't like. I can understand. So, yeah, so why is it still okay? Uh, the point is that the matrix that we have still has the property that it's, um, um, it, this map here is a Lipschitz uh, map uh, to, for the usual L1 matrix on ZD. Uh, the, the matrix, if you want, if you restrict it to ZD, it's actually even a semi-direct product. Uh, so if you restrict the matrix to ZD, to the diagonal matrices, you get the usual L1 matrix on ZD. So that here, if, you, if I want to decompose my, my, my guys, so I have my total and my rabbit becoming. Um, here, I can start decomposing ZD. Start decomposing ZD, whatever the sequence of numbers is given by, by the total. And so by the end of the day, after Z, steps, what I get <coughs> is something which is <coughs> a pre-image of a bounded set there, here, which means something which is cost equivalent to these guys. So after these steps, I, am, I have to deal. So I'm decomposing. Yeah, that's right. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to decompose G first. Then I will end up with bounded pieces in G. I will take the intersection with gamma, and I will go on with this thing. I will have to understand what it is. Okay, so first of all, I start decomposing ZD. Then... But that's not the case of G. Okay. First step, decompose ZD. Second step, pull back, pull back this decomposition. On G, which means that every time, I always, I have this projection here, of this projection here, um, when I, uh, ZD, um, uh, uh, G is the pre-image of ZD, Whenever I take a decomposition of ZD, I take the pre-image of this decomposition. Our disjointness is preserved. And by the end of the day, what I get are bounded pieces in ZD, which I, when I look at them as... Uh, 
Um, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. What I meant, what I meant that, uh, first of all, I decompose ZD. First of all, I decompose ZD. Second step, I pull back by pi. I pull back this decomposition to T. Okay. Now I have a decomposition in T, which ends up with um, things which are pre-images of bonded pieces in ZD. But the third step is to deal with these pre-images. When you take a pre-image of ZD which is bounded in ZD, you get something which is uniformly coarse equivalent to the kernel of pi. So the first step is to decompose U of D Q of X, again with the same distance L. Okay. And why can I do it uh, easily? I will do it, I will do it for D equals two. For d equals 2, uh, u of 2 q of x is only uh, this thing. So it's isomorphic to, so it's essentially uh, q, uh, q of x. And if I look at the distance induced from L uh, to this guy, I can see that the ball of radius r is a subgroup. It's just this, you can check. I mean, it's, uh, check it. It's the set of uh, elements with such that the degree of P minus degree of Q is less or equal than R. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's a ball. It's a ball of, it's a, it's a group. It's stable under addition. So it's a subgroup. But now I can play the same game as I did for these infinite copies of D. And what I get is that, uh, um, that it implies that U is just the direct sums direct sum of R joint copies of cosets of the ball of radius R. Okay, I just take cosets. And for the same reason I explained for these infinite copies of D, this gives you an R joint decomposition. And it's good because now the pieces are bounded. By definition, they are balls of radius R. Okay, so I'm done. I'm done with decomposing TD of Q of X for the distance L, the pseudo distance associated to L. But now, what I get, and of course this is the same as decomposing G, because they are isometric, as pseudometric spaces. But now I could have done it for, on, on gamma. Gamma is a subgroup of this. So I could just restrict this decomposition to gamma every time. Okay? I could, uh, I could restrict this decomposition to gamma every time, and I would get a sequence of decomposition of gamma, the R jointness is always preserved. Uh, this you have to think about it a little bit. The fact that it is R joint for this L distance implies that it would be R joint, or maybe with a different R, but slightly different R, for uh, a world metric on gamma. So but that, that's important. That's the only thing I didn't prove, I, but you have to believe me. So that decomposing for the L distance gives you also a decomposition for the world distance. But now, at the end of the day, what I get is the intersection I have now to decompose. Oh. Okay, maybe I should. Well, just one minute, because I'm almost done. So I'm I'm going to be fast. So, sorry, because I was a bit unclear at some point and I lost time. So yeah, th so now what, what we have is uh, by the end of the day you have, so we have to conclude and obtain a decomposition of gamma. We need to be able to decompose the pieces that you get after all these decompositions, namely we need to decompose gamma intersected with a ball of big radius for the L distance, uh, which lives in, uh, in G. Okay? Because we have been able to decompose up to bounded pieces in G, now you have to deal with these bounded pieces. You restrict them to gamma, and you need to understand what this is. 
But you can check that this is contained in what I will call GLD of D um, of X indexed. Um, I, I don't want to check the there's the correct constant, but some R that depends on R. Which means that so this is not a group; it's just a set of matrices with coefficients in uh, so which is contained in GLD of uh, Z of X, but where the coefficients have uh, have a degree bounded by this R square. Okay. So now I have to decompose these guys, and to do that I will have to embed it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to embed to use the embedding Z of X into R to a power. I'm claiming that this embedding where I take P and I map it, for instance, to P of zero, P of R. I'm claiming that this is um, a discrete embedding which induces a discrete embedding of this guy into a product of R plus one copies of GL of GLD of R. And now I can use the fact that GLD of R has finite synthetic dimension, so, so has this finite product and I can finish the process. I can decompose this thing here. Okay. Uh, here again, I'm putting some details under the carpet, but not serious details. And the reason why it is discrete is very easy, is because if you restrict, if you take, uh, if you extend it to R of X, then you get an isomor uh, vector isomorphism. So it is proper because it's an isomorphism. So if you restrict to a discrete set, it's a discrete. Okay, thank you very much, and sorry for being late. <laughs> Sorry, I think he was first. Sorry. What is the power of the old approach? Oh, it's difficult to. Uh, uh, we can discuss that uh, after the talk if you want. Uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the idea is that you don't have equivariance, but you have uh, you have to com you have to keep track of the um, you have the metric that you have to deal with, and so you have to to use um, the way I think about it is like matrices with bounded propagation. <laughs> That's the way I think about it. <laughs> Uh, um, I can I have to check in Raniski because you are using Raniski. I think it's, Z, I mean, uh, at definitely it's with Z, but that we apply it. But, yeah, that's, uh, we only, I didn't, I didn't check. I didn't check. Sorry, you had the question. Sorry. No. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, we don't know. No, no, no. What? No. What? So, what? K zero cubical complex? What? What was it? Yes. Yes. 
Quel est le groupe qui dans Tno Not very clear what it means. Because K0 group, uh, if it's K0, it has to be a finite dimension. So, uh, uh, yeah, no, not co compactly. Okay. But then it doesn't put, it doesn't give you a lot of, uh, of, of things to work with. <laughs> if, if you don't have any co compactness. Uh, okay. Not only 